We are back, back again. Welcome to AP World History Modern Test Prep for Unit 7. My name is Steph Gerges, and thank you so much for stopping by and getting this far in AP World History. It's awesome. Now, Unit 7 is all about global conflict. If you're like my students, you are so awaiting the day when you got to talk about this content, World War I and World War II. But this unit also encompasses the mass atrocities and genocides that occurred in those world wars and up to more recent years. Now, once you say it that way, I'm not sure why anyone is actually that excited about Unit 7. Um, it's a lot of the darkest parts of humanity that we're going to really highlight here in this video. So, thanks for joining us. Now, before we jump into World War I, where you want to go, let's talk a little bit of context of how we got here. Now, a lot of the biggest historical events and processes in the last unit occurred right at the end. Unit 7 starts with the year 1900, and it was the 15 years earlier that the Berlin Conference occurred, leading to the scramble for Africa. Don't forget that the reason those rising European states engaged in their imperialistic desires was because they were smack dab in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, and they needed those raw materials and markets for their finished products. Great Britain had been leading the race in terms of expansion. C is for colonies, rightly we boast that of all the great nations, Great Britain has the most. That was from a children's book written in 1899 called The ABCs for Baby Patriots, right before this unit began. Now, on the most basic level, most industrialized nations were being imperialistic as they had an insatiable desire for money, and to make money, they needed resources. We know that the major players at the Berlin Conference were the newly unified German state, along with the newly unified Italy, King Leopold of Belgium, and those states that were not so new to colonization. Britain, France, Netherlands, Spain, Portugal. Who wasn't there? Uh, just as a reminder, not a single African was at the table. This hostile takeover over most of the African continent devastated their development and catapulted European nations forward. But let's not sleep on other nations who were engaging in similar ventures elsewhere in the world. Russia was expanding east into Asia and running into a modernizing Japanese state who was also doing the same. In fact, they kick off this period by one of our first conflicts known as the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905 over their rival imperialistic ambitions in Manchuria and Korea. Japan wins and only gets stronger. Meanwhile, other Asian states are struggling as European imperialism wasn't limited to just Africa. The French were in Southeast Asia in modern day Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. The Dutch continued to be influencing life in the Indies. The United States that once opened the doors in Japan also gained control of the Philippines from the Spanish. Great Britain colonized India after the Sepoy Rebellion and continued their uh, drug trading to China, who was then forced into signing the Treaty of Nanjing over the Opium Wars. All of this leads us to the first part of the unit, which focuses on shifting power. Due to all of that, there was a lot of people who were unhappy with their authoritarian governments. Four specific ones we need to acknowledge would be Russia, the Qing Dynasty in China, the Ottoman Empire, and Mexico. Within Russia, the denial of basic rights, the loss in the Russo-Japanese War, the struggles to industrialize, and soon to be massive losses in World War I led the Bolsheviks, Vladimir Lenin, and the working class to revolt and overthrow the Romanov dynasty. And then they set up a communist regime in 1917. The tides are also changing in China, where the Qing dynasty was still reeling from internal revolts like the Taiping Rebellion and the Boxer Rebellion, and the unequal treaties that they had to sign with the British after the Opium Wars. The Han continued to be denied rights under the Manchus leading the Qing dynasty, along with population growth and lack of food, and we have a revolution that was led by Sun Yat-sen. 
This dynastic system that we have been seeing over 2,000 years ends with the creation of the Chinese Republic in 1911. Now, it's not going to last over so long, so don't get so excited about that or used to it, but we'll talk about that more later. Now, the sick man of Europe, also known as the Ottomans, continued to struggle after their unsuccessful Tanzimat reforms. The young Turks continued to push for a state with a Turkish identity. And as we will soon learn, they are on the losing side of World War I and will eventually lead to the creation of a new state called Turkey with a Turkish identity. Mexico may be less familiar to you, but remember, they achieved independence from their Spanish colonizers in 1821. But it wasn't all rosy, as many Creoles continued to have more power and native Mexicans were denied rights. Mexico was under control of dictator Porfirio Diaz. 97% of the land was controlled by 1% of the people, with many peasants landless leading to another revolution nearly 100 years later after they had thrown off the Spanish colonizers. This revolution was led by Pancho Villa and Zapata, which was successful in 1917 to overthrow the dictator and establish a new Mexican government. We'll learn more about their successes in the years to come. So let's look kind of at our cards here. European nations are taking a lot of people's stuff and other nations are struggling to keep up with the unfair game that has begun. Before we know it, we are going to see some big issues on our hands. And that, my friend, will be World War I, which at that time was called the Great War or the War to End All Wars. Don't we wish. Now, there's a super easy acronym to remember the causes of World War I. Maine, or some teachers would say mania. Militarism, alliance system, imperialism, and nationalism. Militarism is the new technologies and weapons created in the Industrial Revolution that will lead European states to spend a whole butt ton of money on their weapons and on their militaries. The alliance system was also instrumental in how World War I began. This was essentially like some playground or commons fight of who's got who's back. Now, these alliances were created prior to the Great War beginning, and when it was all started, everyone rushed in to back their alliances. I is for imperialism, and we know that these rivalries between states over their resources and their colonies led to some tensions between them. And finally, N. N is for nationalism. Remember that nationalism is a devotion to one state, but not just like uber patriotism. It's a belief that your nation state or your country was superior to other countries and you needed to do whatever it takes for the furtherment of your state. This created high tensions, especially with how geographically close European states were to each other. So how do these main causes actually lead to the beginning of World War I? Now, many historians describe it as a powder keg, or you could simply look at it as kind of a chain reaction that couldn't be stopped when you combined those main causes. The event that was the spark for the powder keg or the beginning of our chain reaction of dominoes was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, my guess is you did not win the Geography B, if that's even a thing, but most likely you're probably sketchy of where Serbia and Bosnia even is on the map. Heck, when I was growing up, the whole region fell under the name of Yugoslavia, which is not anymore. It is important to note that much of the region of the Balkans, kind of across the sea from Italy, used to be under control from the Ottoman Empire. And many of these people did not want to be under the Ottoman or Austro-Hungarian thumb. Either way, Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire travels to Bosnia in this region on a political visit. Bosnia was recently annexed from the empire, which made Serbia upset. It was on this political trip that a 19-year-old Serbian national, Gavrilo Princip, shot and killed the Archduke, who was heir to the throne. Now, this is where those main causes come in. Nationalist fervor fueled the assassination in the first place. 
Many people in this region were Slavic, ethnically, and it was a reason for much of the unrest in the Balkan region, as people wanted their own states for their own people group. One month after the assassination, Austria-Hungary gives Serbia an ultimatum. The demands of this ultimatum were pretty harsh, like they were required to take uh, responsibility for the assassination and suppress all, all of it, anti-Austrian propaganda, along with just, you know, eliminating terrorist organizations and their borders. Now, Serbia can't agree to all of those terms and rejects the ultimatum. Then, one month later, Austria-Hungary comes and declares war on Serbia. But why did it take one whole month to react? Back to our main causes of the war. Austria was afraid that if they attacked Serbia, Russia would then attack Austria-Hungary. Slavic nationalism at play, along with the alliance system. To prevent that from happening, Austria spent that month talking to their ally, Germany, to make sure that the Germans would have their back. Germany offered Austria what is commonly known as the blank check, which promised Germany that they had basically Austria's back if Russia aided to Serbia. Alliance is all over the place. Meanwhile, Austria wasn't far off because Russia definitely started to get ready for war before any of this even started. When Austria did declare war after that month after the assassination, they did back Serbia. This leads Germany to tell Russia not to do that, but they do. And then France jumps in to back Russia as well, which leads Germany to declare war on France. Alliances all over the place. So when the fighting began with all that military buildup and new weapons from the Industrial Revolution, there was a major conflict brewing. Despite popular opinion that the Great War was good for nations, remember, nationalism, and that it would be over by Christmas, it wasn't, things got rather dark and deadly pretty quickly. Now, this is the point where I pretty much disappoint a lot of my students and say that our course isn't going to delve into the strategy and battles of the war. For the most part, the College Board wants you to understand the causes and the effects of the war and understand a little bit about how it was conducted. Now, this conducted part really focuses on two components. Number one, the technologies used during the war, and two, that it was a total war. No battles. They don't necessarily want you to know necessarily that. Let's first realize how horrific the war effort was as machine guns were used, as troops were in trenches, and they would attempt to cross no man's land and advance towards each other. Machine guns fired nearly 500 bullets a minute, and the death toll rose significantly in what seemed quite futile. But what could be sent over to the opponents was artillery shells filled with poison gas. They were multiple types used, from tear gas to the most famous of mustard gas, and some types of poison gas were immediately deadly as your internal organs were torn apart, but others would maybe be unnoticeable or just cause you tears. But then sometimes those unnoticeable things would turn into burns on your skin. Gas masks were widely used by soldiers in the war effort. Airplanes were used more for reconnaissance during World War I, and tanks helped move people across these large terrains. But with both sides using these types of weapons, neither side could really win. It resulted in a horrific four-year bloody stalemate. But it wasn't just those on the battlefield that were part of the war. It was a total war. That means that civilians or people of a nation who weren't directly fighting were still a part of the war effort. Women joined men who worked in factories to produce war materials. Governments set up rationing programs to limit the amount of food like bread and meat and flour that families were allowed to buy. The U.S. promoted the idea of victory gardens so that families were urged to plant their own fruits and vegetables. Everyone was expected to do their duty to win the war. Now, the war effort was everywhere, and everyone played a part. I mean, we don't have to look too far to understand what this was like, as most nations in 2020 and 2021 have been focused on the coronavirus pandemic. It's not just the job of doctors and nurses to fight it, but everyone is urged to play a role in winning the battle. 
World War I was much the same. In World War I, there's an extensive propaganda that was used to influence the attitudes and opinions of the community by spreading inaccurate or slanted information. Never heard of that before. Uh, and this played on fears and a lot of dehumanizing tactics. Now, the government would do this with the goal of increasing military enlistment. Plus, it was a truly global war because governments had colonies around the world where they promoted these opportunities for them if they were to join the mother country in fighting. Fighting occurred not just in Europe, but also in the Pacific, in Africa, and in Asia. Now, the tides of the war changed when the United States joined which I promise you is not just some very American thing to say, but the U.S. was living their best isolated life across the Atlantic until two events shaped their involvement to join. The first was the sinking of the Lusitania by the German U-boat, which killed American civilians. The second event would be the Zimmerman telegram, where the German government reached out to Mexico to have them join Germany in the war effort, and then they would help assist them in regaining territory that they lost to the United States. Well, this was enough to have the U.S. join the effort, and at the very tail end of the war in 1917, they provided a fresh wave of soldiers, and they ended that stalemate that we talked about. Now, the winners of World War I gathered at the Paris Peace Conference, and despite varying goals and thoughts, they ended up with the Treaty of Versailles. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson had some ideas that maybe we shouldn't seek revenge and recover after this post-war effort, and he outlined his ideals in the 14 points. Now, some of those ideals included things like self-determination, where people, groups, could determine their statehood, also, he pushed for arms reduction and decolonization. He also urged for the creation of peacekeeping international organizations, which would be called the League of Nations. However, not all of those goals were supported. He was actually seen as quite liberal and too idealistic by many of the Paris Peace Conference. Due to France's country being ripped apart and literally dug up from all the trench warfare, they sought reparations to repair their country. This resulted in some pretty intense terms, such as Germany needing to take the blame for the war, that they needed to demilitarize most of their country, that they had to give up their colonies, that they had to pay significant sums of money in war reparations, like billions. And with the gift of hindsight that we have today, we now know that the Treaty of Versailles can immediately be put on the causes list for World War II. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. The Great War may have been over, but the effects were not. The belief that war was good for nations was shut down, and many described the world to be in a state of anxiety and disillusionment. Germans really struggled with how to pay those war reparations. So they did what any sensible economist would do. Let's just print more money, which led to inflation and rising prices. It also devalued their money. Their struggle to pay France and Britain led to France and Britain being unable to pay the United States back for their loans given during World War I. Then we had the stock market crash of 1929, and the United States entered the Great Depression. Capitalism and Adam Smith's laissez-faire economics seemed to be an utter failure. It was devastating around the world with such interconnected markets, but especially in Germany. Economist John Maynard Keynes critiqued the hands-off approach of governments and promoted the idea of deficit spending, or stimulus spending, to jumpstart the economy. By cutting taxes and getting money into the hands of people, the economy could then recover. You've seen this within your lifetime, as this has been very popular during the pandemic, as governments have given stimulus checks to people. And even back in 2008, we saw this happen as well when there was an economic downturn. U.S. President FDR had programs that were inspired by Keynesian economics, known as the New Deal. It focused on relief for those who were unemployed, promoted spending by the government on projects that were good for the country, which would then employ people to help them get out of their financial crisis. It's a win-win. And reform government policies that allowed the economy to get in the place where it crashed. A little more hands-on. Side note, 
I teach at Appleton West High School in Appleton, Wisconsin. And our high school was the original Appleton High School. And we were actually known as the Million Dollar School. Our school is one of the legacies of the Works Progress Administration, which was one of the agencies created in the New Deal. The WPA employed millions of Americans to carry out public works projects and the building where I teach was built from that. How cool is that? Anyways, the economic depression that impacted countries globally was one of the issues that continued into the interwar period. Let's do a quick whip around around the world to check in how other nations were doing economically and how they were reacting to this crisis. Japan's exports during this era dropped significantly, but also recovered the fastest. Russia left World War I because of the Bolshevik Revolution. When Vladimir Lenin then shifted from the Romanov dynasty to communist rule, however, their economy was not doing so well under communist rule. And Lenin introduced a program called the New Economic Plan, which allowed farmers to sell excess and was basically this small scale, limited capitalist system. But it will end with the death of Lenin. Joseph Stalin will bring some new economic policies like the five-year plan, which hoped to have the USSR catch up industrializing. And he also pushed for collectivization of farms, which led to some significant famines and millions of people starved to death. Plus add in Stalin's repressive policies and denial of basic rights, and he will end up there on the not so great leaders of history. More on that later. Now, Mexico's economy was improving in the 1930s through the 1970s as they nationalized their oil industries. This really angered foreign investors, but nationalization of oil allowed the Mexican government to benefit from their oil revenues versus their oil purely benefiting, you know, their investors, who were mostly foreigners. If you've ever traveled to Mexico or you live there, uh, you would know that Pemex gas stations are all around and they are the second largest state-owned oil company all around the world. Another factor that we need to be aware of in this interwar period is the rise of fascism. Fascism is a political system that is known for extreme nationalism, violence, including armed military struggles to get to their goals, and what I'm gonna call is scapegoating. They largely blamed others mostly ethnic minorities, for their issues that they were experiencing in their state, which was, you know, not their fault. These ethnic minorities became the scapegoat and ultimately the target of these fascist states. So let's see how fascism was at play during this era. Italy was the first country to turn to fascism. While Italy was a victor in World War I, they didn't really gain as much from the Treaty of Versailles at the Paris Peace Conference. This discontent led to the rise of Benito Mussolini. First, fascist party took control of their parliament, and then Mussolini became a dictator of the nation. He turned into a totalitarian state where they had total control, and fascist propaganda began to be part of their education system. Remember how Italy lost to the Ethiopians, um, and they were one of the only independent African states? Well, Italy went back. The League of Nations attempted to chill Italy out, but the hypocrisy of imperialist actions were obvious, and the League really failed them from expanding into Ethiopia. Post-World War I, the German monarchy was replaced by the democratically elected Weimar Republic. However, not many citizens were fan, as Germany was struggling hardcore from reparations, hyperinflation, unemployment, and they wanted a strong leader in government. A new party emerged known as the National Socialist German Workers' Party, more popular known as the Nazi Party and much shorter. They obtained the most seats in parliament in the 1932 elections. Adolf Hitler was part of this Nazi party, and at first he was named chancellor in 1932, and then the current president died and he took over as president. Hitler for sure fits the definition of a fascist, as he was ultra-nationalistic, ultra-militaristic, and he banned other political parties. And then he did some serious scapegoating. Remember all those German economic problems that we were just discussing? Well, he found the minority group that he would blame, the Jews. His fake scientific theories that said that his Aryan race was more advanced and purer than others, and his anti-Semitic thought was really fueled throughout Germany. 
He went all out on propaganda movement and promoted the idea that Jews were inferior and they needed to be purged from the country. He passed the Nuremberg Laws, which took away German citizenship um, from Jewish people, forbade them to marry Germans, and denied them other rights. This obviously increased hostility towards Jewish people, and it led to Kristallnacht, which translates to the Night of the Broken Glass, where German citizens, instigated by Nazi leaders, to have riots which destroyed thousands of synagogues where people worshipped, Jewish businesses, and caused the death of 90 German Jews. 30,000 Jews were then arrested and sent to concentration camps. This was all before World War II even began. Hitler's also quite vocal about needing more living space and really just publicized to the world his future land grabs. Uh, now, before we jump into World War II, we have to address the reality that colonized people were quite aware of the hypocrisy of Europeans. They seemingly supported self-determination for white regions, but not for their own colonies. In fact, Middle Eastern regions that were once controlled by the Ottomans fell under this new mandate system, which looked a whole heck of a lot like new colonization with this fancy name. I mean, the League of Nations stated that these colonized people needed tutelage of more advanced nations, which sounds a lot like a civilizing mission and a lot like white man's burden that we've talked about before. Nationalist movements began brewing as they felt as though they didn't gain what was promised to them as they fought in World War I. Check out this letter from British-controlled Malawi in Africa. We natives have been loyal but in times of peace, the government failed to help the underdog. In times of peace, everything was for Europeans only. But in times of war, it had been found that we are needed to share the hardships and shed our blood in equality. They are invited to die for a cause which is not theirs. Let's do a quick check in on these brewing independence movements. In India, there was a larger push for self rule and decolonization. Gandhi will be instrumental in leading these nonviolent civil disobedient movements. Civil disobedience is the act of breaking the law because you believe the law is unjust and then accepting the punishment for it. He was involved in the Indian National Congress and pushed for boycotts of British goods which we remember the European goal when imperialism was to obtain resources and sell finished goods. Well, Gandhi pushed to boycott those finished goods, specifically British textiles. They also broke the law and produced their own salt, which again, the British were trying to sell to them at inflated prices. Others in Southeast Asia were disappointed that independence wasn't granted to them after the sacrifices they made in World War I. In Africa, independence movements were started by Africans who were educated under the colonial school systems or Africans who had even traveled to Europe. They too believed in the idea of self-determination and the values of the enlightenment. For example, Jomo Kenyatta traveled and was educated in London. He will later then fight for Kenyan independence. West Africans under French rule started a series of strikes against the French rail system that they worked for all these things so they could gain independence. Plus, the sketchy new mandate system will create some tensions between Jews and Muslims, especially with the Balfour Declaration in 1917, which stated that there should be a Jewish homeland in Palestine. I mean, this land was historically the home to the Jewish people. But in the nearly 1500 years later, it was also home to Muslims. It was part of the former Muslim empires like the Umayyad, the Abbasid, and the Ottoman. Because Palestine was under British rule in the mandate system, many Jews began to move to this region. This is going to get real messy soon, but we're not there yet, so just hold on for unity. Now, unlike World War I, which the main causes were intertwined, World War II is a bit easier to pinpoint. Hitler. Well, and the failure of the League of Nations. An appeasement. Treaty of Versailles. Okay. Let's break it all down. We know that the Weimar Republic was on the struggle bus economically. Then Adolf Hitler came into control, which again, the people wanted at that time. They wanted a strong leader to pull them out of their economic crisis. In 1935, he broke the Treaty of Versailles by beginning to build up their military, 
The trauma of the Great War was fresh in everyone's mind, and they did not want to start a new conflict with Hitler. They utilized the policy of appeasement. Now, my friends, I am very familiar with this policy. It's the policy that every parent that is in a store with their child and their child wants something and they ponder appeasement. You see, when I'm at the store, my child Lincoln wants a matchbox car and I need to decide in that moment, do I give in to the demands or do I tell them he does not need like the 100th matchbox car? I then rationalize. It's a dollar. It's not a lot of price to pay. If I say no, we may have a situation on our hands where I need to deal with his crying and screaming and upsetness. Or I could buy the $1 car. Appeasement, my friends. It's something that we deal with very often as parents. Well, this was the same struggle of the League of Nations. Do we just give in and let Hitler build up his military, even though it defies the treaty? Do we ignore the fact that he is stationing troops in the Rhineland? Or do we want an all out fit and target? I mean, Europe. Then we have this situation of the Sudetenland. This was a small area that was a part of Czechoslovakia that had a large amount of German people living in it. Self-determination. Hitler thought that they should have this land. Uh, German people, self-determination. Again, the policy of appeasement was the way that European kind of leaders went. Give Hitler the Sudetenland and we will have a good day. But was this enough? Was he satisfied? Nope, he wanted more. And he realized that those European powers were not willing to challenge him. And now he wanted Czechoslovakia and he took it by an armed invasion. And then he invaded Poland. And it's then that leaders realized, hey, we probably should do something. Appeasement is failing. Behind the scenes, we also have to note that Hitler also reached out to Stalin to create a non-aggression pact, which is essentially what it sounds like. They will not be aggressive towards each other. And Hitler told of his plans to invade Poland. Britain and France also realized that if Poland was attacked, like it was, that they were officially going to go to war. So on September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland and Britain and France declared war on Germany. World War II officially began on that day. Now, on a side note, let's not forget that Japan had also been engaging in its own imperialistic adventures in Asia. In 1931, eight years earlier, they advanced militarily on Manchuria. And in 1937, they were showing their dominance in China, specifically in the region of Nanking. We'll come back to that. Now, I know you want to talk about the battles, and you've seen the World War II movies. Saving Private Ryan, Pearl Harbor, Midway, Dunkirk, Hacksaw Ridge, Unbroken, Valkyrie, Flags of Our Father, Wonder Woman. I mean, it's no Marvel movie, but Captain America is. I mean, you get the gist. But my recommendation is to watch a couple of World War movies and then Google how accurate they were. I mean... There's another slew of movies that also talk about mass atrocities, which are really, really powerful. Um, and we're gonna discuss that in just a second. So I also would recommend Boy in the Striped Pajamas, Schindler's List, The Pianist, The Book Thief, The Zookeeper's Wife, just to name a few. Um, I'm all about the movie things. Look in the comments below uh, for more information. But I really feel like there's something about a storyline of a movie that draws you in and you're gonna remember more of that than bullet points that I put on a slide or probably in this video. But combined the movie and this video and you are gonna be ready to write a really epic AP essay or answer SAQ questions. But what do we need to know about World War II and how it was conducted that does align with the College Board? I think the historical thinking skills of change and continuity are really strong skills here when we are looking at the two world wars. Now, changes are typically easier to identify. Something used to be like this, and now it's like this. It morphed, it changed. When identifying changes in AP writing, it's always good to explain what it looked like and what it changed to. Now, I'm not sure what speed you're watching this video at. Yes, I'm talking to you, 
1.5. Pastor? Whoa. Uh, let's give your brain a little bit of a break. And I literally want you to answer this question and pause the video. Identify some changes in continuities between how World War I and World War II was conducted. Like literally hit the pause button and write some down or drop them in the description below. What are some changes or continuities between how the two world wars were conducted? I'll wait for you. So one of the major changes in how the wars were conducted was about the speed at which they occurred. In World War I, it was a lot of trench warfare, and this changed to a much faster moving war in World War II. I would then support that claim by giving evidence. I talk about how Hitler used the strategy of Blitzkrieg, which was a lightning fast war to quickly subdue their opponents. Obviously, that was different from the stalemate that we saw in World War I. One example. Or perhaps you wrote about the change in fighting strategies and techniques. World War I was primarily a ground battle engaged in trench warfare, whereas World War II, the technologies used in battles shifted to the air as well. Again, we'd want some specific examples as evidence. I could talk about the discontinuing of poison gas to using tactics like firebombing or the introduction of aerial fighting with the B-29 bombers. Additionally, the most obvious change was the introduction of atomic weaponry at the end of World War II, as we are looking at the bombings in Japan. Now, remember, an easy thing to remember about technology in general is that it always seems to get better, faster, more efficient. And this is true of military technologies as much as it is with your iPhone. Continuities are examples of trends that stay the same or they continue. During the war effort, World War II was also a total war, and they also continued to use some significant propaganda just like World War I. Some evidence that backs up this claim would be that the United States government used Rosie the Riveter and that art to promote women working in factories with slogans like, we can do it. Uncle Sam was asking people to buy war bonds or enlist in the military. People still had ration books and stamps to purchase items to ensure that there was food on the war front. Now, another continuity maybe that you wrote down would be the global nature of the war as colonial people fought for the parent company. Or maybe the reality of the continuity that some women joined the war effort, but as a general rule, mostly men are fighting on the battlefront. I am sure you thought of even more than I just mentioned, but this video... It's getting long and you're watching it pretty fast. So we got to wrap this baby up, but throw some more ideas in the comments below. Aside from these changes and continuities, it is important that we remember how governments use ideologies, including fascism and communism to mobilize all of their state's resources for the war effort. And in the case of totalitarian states like Germany under Hitler and Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, who would repress basic freedoms and dominate many aspects of daily life during the course of the conflicts and even beyond them. So one other important thing to note about World War II is the idea that the Soviet Union switched sides. We know that they signed the non-aggression pact earlier in the war effort as they are about to begin. But Hitler broke that pact and did invade the Soviet Union for more living space, which then switched the sides that Stalin, the communist regime, was fighting in during World War II. I and my husband went to Moscow when we found really cheap airline tickets. And when we were in Moscow, it happened to be the day that they were celebrating Victory Day um, and 75 years after the end of World War II. And one of the really unique things is one, we know that Stalin was a really repressive dictator, totalitarian leader um, in the Soviet Union. We also know he fought on our side as the allies during World War II. And so this strange reality of people celebrating Victory Day and Stalin in Moscow as well as the idea of understanding who Stalin was, was very strange. I'm not going to lie. And something that I always tell, uh, and I think is really important, is the idea um, that 
when I was there watching Russia Today and their news media, uh, it talked a lot about how Americans did not realize the amount of deaths of citizens of the Soviet Union during World War II there was, which is also true about World War I. Continuity. But here's the deal. Uh, so many people lost someone in their family during World War II. In a lot of ways, the Soviet Union bore the brunt of many of the deaths during the war effort on the side of the Allies after Hitler invaded. So be aware of that and do not, again, have most of history be shaped of what happens next in the story with the Cold War. But at this time, we were on the same team and we have a race to Berlin that will happen towards the end of World War II, which the Soviets will push from one side, the United States and D-Day will push from another, and eventually we'll get to the city of Berlin. They will get there first. Um, Hitler will commit suicide, and we will see that we push for the end, or Victory Day in Europe, VE Day, um, in Europe, which will end World War II. We know that World War II will end in the Pacific Theater with the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan. The final focus of Unit 7 is mass atrocities and genocide that occurred during this era. Now, I have a whole video purely on this, and you can click, or is it here? You can click up here uh, for that screencast about the different stages of genocide, including dehumanization and symbolization and polarization, um, and really looking at more in depth at Armenia, the Holocaust, and the Japanese atrocities in China. Plus, I have some stories and pictures from my own trip when I was able to go to Auschwitz in Poland, which was powerful and heartbreaking. Now, as we've talked about before, the rise of extremist groups in power led to the attempted destruction of specific populations as they became the scapegoats for other issues. Now, the most famous is the Nazi killing of the Jews in the Holocaust during World War II. However, the first major incident of ethnic violence occurred in the Ottoman Empire during World War I. As we've discussed before, there was a group of reformers called themselves the Young Turks, and they really wanted to establish a more modern constitutional government in their land. Now, remember how the Ottoman Empire had been called the sick man of Europe? Well, Armenians were an ethnic group within the Ottoman Empire, and they were kind of hoping to have an equal place in this new state that the Young Turks were pushing forward. Now, these three pashas soon announced that their plan to Turkify one religion, one language, one people in their empire and remove all threats to it. Well, Armenians were Christians and not Muslims. And like most Turks, they didn't speak Turkish. And well, they weren't Turkish. And in spite of all these obstacles and differences, they really were hoping and kind of thrived under the Ottoman rule before. And they were more educated and sometimes even more wealthy than their Turkish neighbors, which led to the resentment. Now this story is starting to sound familiar and we're just getting started. In 1915, the Armenian genocide began. The Turkish government arrested and executed several hundred Armenian intellectuals and then targeted ordinary Armenians who were taken from their homes and set on a death march throughout the Syrian desert without food, without water, and just were told to keep walking. Those reports vary, but many sources agree that there were 2 million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire before these acts in 1922, and then later only 400,000 Armenians remained in the Ottoman Empire. Now, Hitler's actions in Europe are one of the most obvious examples of genocide and ethnic violence in the 20th century. The Nazis were the perpetrators of these heinous acts and were targeting the Jews, as we discussed earlier, and them being seen as the scapegoat for Germany's economic woes. Now, the regime established the first concentration camps, imprisoning its political opponents, people who were gay, Jehovah's Witnesses, and other people that they classified as dangerous. Extensive propaganda was used to spread the Nazi party's racist goals and ideals. When World War II began, the Jews and these other groups were the first used to kind of round up in concentration and labor camps, again, for the total war effort. Then they were used to produce weapons and supplies for the war front. It wasn't until 1942 to 1945 that Hitler rolled out the final solution, which involved the extermination camps that you've heard about and resulted in the killing of more than 6 million Jews. 
That number is tricky though, because the total number of deaths is probably even higher when you add in those other groups that were targeted and were at those extermination camps. And at the end of the day, we have a horrific and very tragic event. To add on to these awful scenarios, the Japanese also targeted the Chinese in 1937 in what is called the Nanking Massacre. Nanking was the capital of China, and it fell to the Japanese forces as they were expanding their empire. The Japanese general then ordered the city of Nanking to be destroyed. Much of the city was burned, and the Japanese troops launched a campaign of atrocities against the civilian population which in my class we discuss how purposeful targeting of civilians in war is always wrong. Now, this was also known as the Rape of Nanking, as Japanese soldiers raped at least 20,000 women and girls of all ages. They also butchered an estimated 150,000 male w war prisoners and massacred an additional 50,000 male civilians. When all is said and done, it is estimated over 300,000 Chinese were killed. But when World War II ended, the United Nations was created and nations pledged to uphold human rights with the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and all of these atrocities ended. Wait, they didn't end? Well, that's awful. We find that there are more instances of genocide over the years. In 1994, members of the Hutu ethnic majority in the nation of Rwanda murdered as many as 800,000 Tutsi people. We see the same tactics of dehumanization, classification, and lots of propaganda. Government-sponsored radio stations started calling on ordinary Rwandan civilians to murder their neighbors, and within three months, the extermination plans were started, and again, 800,000 people were killed. Again, the movie Hotel Rwanda is super powerful. I highly recommend it. And I'm not sure if you've learned as much about this in your class as we're getting at the end of the year and there's a time crunch. In Cambodia, under the Marxist leadership of Pol Pot, there was attempts to create a Cambodian master race through social engineering. And this ultimately led to the death of more than 2 million people in Southeast Asia from 1975 to 1979. And I'll keep pitching movies if you want to look at more about this, I would watch The Killing Fields. Now there are many more examples of ethnic violence in Ukraine under the Soviet Union, Darfur in Sudan, the Rohingya in Myanmar, the Uyghur population and other Turkish Muslims in China, and the list continues. We must all do our part to do whatever it takes to stop these types of ethnic violence. When we see dehumanizing language, we need to call it out. When we see the media classify people as us versus them, we take note. When we see jokes and memes and gifs and other media that polarizes and spews misinformation about groups of people, especially minority groups, we call it out. It's dangerous and it can, if not stopped, lead to ethnic violence and potentially even genocide. Mass atrocities don't happen overnight. They build over time and language matters immensely. We can all do our part to build a better future where these events decrease or stop before they rise to the levels of ethnic violence and genocide that we've seen throughout history. Thanks again for joining me for Unit 7. Be sure to check back out all the information in the description below, movies, quizlets, notes, etc and things that didn't make the review video. I hope you check out the test prep videos in this playlist. Subscribe, hit the bell, and stay tuned for future videos. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time with Unit 8 Review. Now there's a super easy acronym. Now there's a super... <laughs> Victory Gardens. Plant those veggies, plant those fruits. Okay, here we go. Sorry, Adam Smith, you were a failure. Post-World War I, the German monarchy was replaced by the democratically elected Weimar Republic. However, not many citizens were fans as Germany was struggling from hardcore... Nope, they were struggling from hardcore... They were struggling hardcore. With... 
That's not what I wanted to say. Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Back again. Tell a friend and subscribe. Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Guess who's back? We did it! Unit 8 is recorded. I'm so pumped. Wait a minute, that was unit seven. <laughs> we did it. Unit seven is recorded. Eight and nine is coming, my friends. It's been a long road. And you can do this AP business.